Uh, welcome all. It's a, a great pleasure to be moderating such a significant and relevant panel during the 113th session of the Council, um, IOM Strategy on Migration, Environment and Climate Change establishes in one of its pillar activities the convening role of IOM and IOM capacity and resources to bring the voices of people affected by climate change, environmental degradations and disaster into different forums of discussion and policy coordination. Um, it's extremely uh, relevant to IOM to highlight that climate action cannot be effective if it's not inclusive. Uh, climate action must consider the integration of voices and live the experiences of the people it's meant to serve and to ensure that there is equality and opportunities are made available to the most impacted by climate. Climate hazards do not affect all populations equally, but they can deepen pre-existing inequalities and expose vulnerable groups, including women, children, youth, elderly, in extremely vulnerable situations, uh, but also with a gender-diversified identity and expressions that translate into new vulnerabilities. Communities depending on natural resources for their livelihoods are the ones impacting less on the environment, yet they are suffering the worst consequences of climate change impacts and environmental degradation. These communities often have the least capacity to respond to climate-related hazards like droughts, floods and cyclones as discussed previously. Communicating the urgency of the current climate crisis, including its impacts on human mobility, is thus critical. And it's imperative also that we empower and protect all of those voices from the marginalized communities that include youth that want to speak and have a voice on the decisions of their future. Therefore, the testimonies of these groups are a significant contribution to shaping policies like adaptation plans and risk reduction strategies. IOM strongly believes that migrants, diaspora, are sending and receiving communities can help address current and future sustainable development challenges and calls for the whole of society approach to address these challenges. Diasporas are essential actors who can shape their ex share their expertise, transfer knowledge and technology to address the climate crisis. But whilst the value of diaspora contributions from remittances to direct investments in skills transfer in their countries of origin has been widely recognized as a contributing factor to address climate change, there are still several challenges we, that we need to discuss on designing policies in the countries of receiving and how exporting technologies, resources, ideas and skills, but also leveraging networks is extremely important. The Institutional Strategy on Migration, Environment and Climate Change of IOM points that we are committed to support the development of enabling environments that can help migrants, diasporas and their communities directly contribute to climate action and sustainable development in places of origin and destination. We need to continue and raise the voices of youth, diaspora, marginalized communities and the ones most vulnerable to ensure that we have an inclusive mobilization of a whole of society in decision-making processes that relate to climate change and migration. Our discussions today aim to highlight the importance of an effective and inclusive climate action with the objective of leaving no one behind, but also to discuss the various channels through which we can ensure that migrants have their voices heard and are part of decision-making processes. Today, we will have four panelists from a diverse range that will come and contribute with their perspectives, their views on the nexus between climate change, environmental degradation, disasters and human mobility. First, we will hear from the Honorable Dr. Andri Kobenda Kunfu, the Special Envoy of the Climate Vulnerable Forum from the Ghana Presidency. Dr. Kobenda is the Executive Director of the Environment Protection Agency in Ghana and is currently serving in several boards in the country. We will also hear from Ms. Vania Alexandra Lorena Velasquez from Latin America and the Caribbean Regional Office for Migration, Youth and Children. 
platform. Vanya is a young education and equal opportunities right advocate who comes from an indigenous community high in the peaks of the Andean mountains. And finally, we will also have Ms. Elizabeth Mungling-Smith, Global Jamaica Diaspora Council for Development. Elizabeth is a government appointed member to the Global Jamaica Diaspora Council for Development and team lead for the Planet Working Group, which focus on working with government, ministries, departments and other agencies to enable a multi-sectorial approach to national climate resilience. And to end the panel, Ms. Christelle Slilsikana from the African Union Diaspora Youth Initiative. Christelle provides project management support and consultancy on EU African Union projects and via her functions at the African Diaspora Youth Initiative. She is the contact point for climate and migration working group where she has worked in this thematic and other areas related with climate security, peace buildings, youth and leadership. Without further ado, I would like to uh, invite the Honorable Dr. Andri Kobena Kofofu to present his statement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Your Excellencies, distinguished speakers, dear colleagues, uh, I bring warm greetings uh, from Ghana. The President of the Republic of Ghana, His Excellency Nana Adedankwa Ekufuadu, who is also the lead and the head of the Ghana CDF Presidency. Do you agree with me that migrants are among the most emblematic human faces of climate change in our contemporary world? I'm very honored and pleased to be part of this specific panel during IOM's 113th Council Session. This is a timely panel, as we all still recover from the efforts made at COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt. Climate vulnerable nations fought hard to keep the 1.5 degree objective alive. Multiple advances have been made regarding climate migration at finance, capacity building, laws and damage and climate action levels. Yet so much needs to be done. It is interesting to be part of a panel that honors migrants, diasporas, by making their voices heard and their contributions to sustainable development and to climate action more visible. What our distinguished panels, panelists present today will represent their vision, their work, their activities that cut across borders. Those hopes and struggles and our love for families, friends, and communities are never stopped by frontier. I am pleased to take the floor on behalf of the Ghana CVF Presidency to present the CVF-led initiative, Migrants for Climate and for Sea. It is a new decade to act on climate change and migration that was launched at COP27 during a ministerial event led by Bangladesh together with IOM. Here I was, uh, I had a singular opportunity to meet the Director General himself, Mr. Antonio. This new initiative implements our CVF presidency priority on migration, to expand support for climate change migrants and displaced persons, and to leverage migrant communities' contributions to climate action in support of all CVF members. For the, the past decade, CVF work on migration has encompassed high-level events with strong advocacy impact in collaboration with IOM. The ministerial launching at IOM's Council in 2014, hosted by the permanent mission of Bangladesh to the United Nations, and IOM, the ministerial breakfast at UN Secretary General Climate Summit in New York in 2019, and the IOM Geneva International Dialogue on Migration in 2021. It is has a pleasure continue our engagement with this panel today. 
What at all is my migrant for climate about? One, it is about shifting the narrative from climate vulnerability to resilience and eventually to prosperity by engaging experience and migrants as active and dynamic players of climate solutions through inclusive approaches, in particular in national climate prosperity plans, uh, which is being supported by CBM. It is interesting to note that at COP27, Bangladesh, Ghana, Maldives, and Sri Lanka presented their plans uh, at the various levels of work in progress. Two, we intend to mobilize greater solidarity and support for communities most vulnerable to climate change and affected by displacement and migration, increasingly driven by growing impacts of climate change. Next is to focus on migration in the context of slow onset impacts of climate change, such as extreme heat, desertification, sea level rise, loss of ecosystems and biodiversity, as well as ocean acidification. We intend to build partnerships to support migrants and their experience in climate action with the private sector involvement. The United Nations, academic counterparts, civil society, and cities across the world are all invited in this endeavor. Including displacement issues in the funding arrangements for laws and damage, to address laws and damage and innovative laws and damage finance. Global Shield Against Climate Risk and in the COP27 finance accounts. And this, I must say, with some level of um, proud pride that um, together we all fought hard to get the loss and damage agenda pushed and the success as well. The Federal Republic of Germany, um, presidency of the G7, also launched the Global Shield Against Climate Risk, which is a very, very positive uh, action uh, recorded in the COP27. Sixth, seeing the full and effective implementation of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration in all areas dealing with climate change, resilience, disasters due to natural hazards, and environmental degradation protect the environment while promoting development. Ghana is a champion country for the implementation of the GCM. The initiative will support the implementation of the pledge submitted by Bangladesh on behalf of CBF at the International Migration Review Forum in May 2020 in New York. The next is to acknowledge the role of migrants in sustainable development running across the full spectrum of SDGs. Here are eight examples of the span of the initiative. One, reducing inequalities, access with SDG 10. Partnership, SDG 17. Sustainable cities, SDG 11. Climate action, SDG 13. Clean energy, SDG 7. Clean Water and Sanitation, SDG 6, Life on Land, SDG 15, and Life Below Water, SDG 14. And this clearly demonstrates the commitment of the migrants for climate as aligned to the aspirations of the uh, SDGs um, initiatives. Eight will be to recognize the adverse impacts of climate change on migrants' rights in line with the Paris Agreement preamble and supporting the work of the UN uh, Special Rapporteur on the promotion and protection of human rights in the context of climate change and with the Special Advisor of the Secretary General on solutions to internal displacement. And here again, um, the concept of uh, climate justice uh, come to play. So at CBF, you do recognize that we cannot do anything without um, recognizing or upholding the rights of the people. Uh, 
far as climate change effects are concerned. As part of this initiative, the Climate for Action Award will identify, recognize, and support the most innovative practices. The migration focus will be considered such as diaspora's investments and transfers of skills, migrant community-based solutions, labor migration, green and blue jobs, reintegration in home countries, and migrants' integration in host countries. The award will identify diverse, diverse types of activity that contribute to climate action such as clean energy, water, waste and sanitation management, land re rehabilitation, resilience building activities, agroecology, ocean and maritime solutions, or ecosystems preservation. We aim to award the prize, we aim to award the prize um, in 2023 as part of CVF contributions to COP28. To conclude, the CVF Ghana presidents looks forward to the development and achievements of the Migrants for Climate Initiative, trying voices and actions beyond borders. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of this all important engagement. Thank you for your indulgence. Wish you. Dr. Henry, thank you so much for your words and, and for the discussions we had at, at, at COP27. It's a pleasure hearing you again and receiving the message of CVF. I would like now to invite Ms. Vania Alexandra Lerena Velasquez to provide her statement. Thank you so much to the moderator for the floor and for IOM for the opportunity today to represent young migrant and indigenous perspectives as a priority of the IOM Council. I'm here on behalf of the Migration and Children Platform, the largest global youth-led and self-organized stakeholder group for youth and children in migration governance processes as the Latin America and the Caribbean Regional Officer. Our organization has partnered closely with IOM on key advocacy spaces such as the Global Forum for Migration and Development and the Global Compact for Migration Reviews and we're committed to continuing our strong strategic focus on the inclusion and embedding of diverse youth vo voices across IOM. My name is Bani Alexandra Yerena Velasquez from Lima, Peru. I look like a cute, typical Andean and indigenous girl, right? It's because my roots come from there, the Peruvian highlands. Every year, 200,000 people move from their rural communities in Peru to the Peruvian capital, Lima, according to Ipsos Peru. My family and I were one of them. I'm proud of my Andean roots. My family comes from Puno, Aymaran roots, and the highland of Lima, Quechua. My story is not a story of migration by choice. It's a story of displacement. While growing up, I went through hardships, from limited access to proper education to having to decide whether to eat or attend a school. I grew up in a place where there is no sanitation, no access to healthcare, no electricity, and more. For years, my people have been perceived as ignorant. However, we have been simply excluded from society, put into a box far away with no education and no opportunities at all. All because of deep brutal discrimination permitting many of the Lima's communities. Go take care of your crops, I was told. But what if I don't want to? I want to grow things, yes, but I want to grow hope. I want to grow resilience and I want to grow opportunities for people like me. Because when you think about a migrant, you mostly think of a person who goes to a foreign country. But it's not always like that. Indigenous people are often internally displaced too. They also tried to bury me, but what they didn't know was that I was the seed and they were putting me in fertile soil. I grew up mostly in Lima, Peru capital, known by us as the Peruvian dream and the promise of having better opportunities in life. Does it really provide us with better opportunities with its level of pollution? Nowadays, sustainable cities are as necessary as mostly, especially in the most contaminated areas where modern systems could stop harmful consequences of environmental degradation. However, this is not the case. Coming up with forward-thinking solutions poses too many obstacles for our public officers, right? Instead of sustainable infrastructure and design, we have big industries that contaminate our rivers, and our animals die because of that. We face deforestation in order to let innovation come to our lands. We do not need that. You are forcing onto us the definition of thriving and our perspective and opinion of is disregarded. 
We need, and I make a call for action, a sustainable city with solutions co-created in partnership among governments, policymakers, international entities, and local leaders. Because the later on, they mostly know what their own communities do for the most. They also, what if we invest in more livable cities? We have seen countries rise from ashes in Europe. For example, turning into thriving communities and economies. What is stopping us from rebuilding our future together with indigenous communities in Latin America? Is it that we don't see it or we don't want to see it? In the highlands, I hide to ride a llama or a donkey to get to school at the age of four, passing through abysses, mountains, rivers, and in low temperatures. People have drowned in some rivers just because they wanted to get educated. Not, some others die every year because of the cold air masses due to lack of prevention measures for these temperatures that continuously fall due to climate change. I was all alone with a backpack in which you could find papers and a pencil, but I could see hope inside it. A lot of us were doing sustainable innovations, but they go unnoticed because of the communication barriers and widespread discrimination. Peru had more than 150 languages, but by 2015, 37 of them have gone lost. Furthermore, most international opportunities for youth are in English in Peru. What is Peru doing towards teaching us a foreign language if we cannot still get to 100% in our own indigenous languages? I call on the Peruvian authorities to implement a course within the Peruvian schools to learn at least one indigenous language. In other countries, students learn two languages in a school, and their economies are better prospering. If I can be here talking to you right now in English, it's because I got a full scholarship in Lima to learn English outside the school system. And even though English is taught in schools, the only phrase my classmates could say by graduation was, can I go to the bathroom, please? Because of people like me cannot afford education like that. Because you cannot love what you don't know. And I call upon international organizations present today to look into indigenous children as well in Peru and go there talking their own language because to understand truly what they are facing nowadays is to talk to them in their own unique language. I call upon you to ensure that indigenous people are not only provided with education, but quality education and quality and dignified workspaces. I call upon you to work along with the Peruvian government to look into the agricultural products that come directly from the indigenous farmers and support it and sell it in a fair price that can allow them to obtain a decent revenue and not throw away the whole harvest, as we have seen before, because the returns are smaller than the expenses most of the time. And I make a call to all the countries who have similar realities, because maybe the indigenous or native people cannot make it here. But it's time to reflect whether we want to have an active engagement or we are just decided to ignore this issue. In Lima, I had to take a bus which contaminates to get to school because there is no sustainable transportation. Options were available only in Dubai, where I am living right now, where I am studying with a full ride scholarship for my undergraduate studies. I also learned about more numerous sustainable enterprises and sustainable cities, such as where the last Expo Dubai 2020 was held and where the COP28 is going to be held. Maybe this is the one of the reasons why some places strive and some others are stuck. We need diverse youth voices here at this conference also, because young people are the ones who will inherit this planet. Along with your expertise and new ideas, all together, we can create a better future for all. For instance, Julio Garay grew up with a name in the highlands of Peru. Yes, Peru became of the, one of the South American countries with the highest rate of food insecurity according to the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. The highlands are the major exporters of food because of their diverse crops, but are the most affected because of most of the production doesn't follow the circular economy principles. Julio is fighting with anemia with cookies made with fortified wheat flour, lentils, sangrecita, kiwicha, egg, chia, among others. In addition, the cookies contain proteins, minerals, and vitamin C to improve the absorption of nutrients. Another innovation was created by Horse Health, Fredo, Nila, and Angie. They designed a transparent bag similar to plastic that is biodegradable and even edible, which is made from cassava scarch. In addition, they created packaging made of bihau and banana leaves, which can be easily replaced with styrofoam or polystyrene in the food industry and others. But usually these innovations and social enterprises are not much subsidized, though. At COP27, I had the opportunity to look at how other youth were embracing their different realities and facing the local challenges in a sustainable way. We need to look at how our specific challenges can be tackled and not framely only in an industrialized way.
In Lima, I got the opportunity to get educated, even if my grandma couldn't. In Lima, I got to have food on my table every day. But in Lima, I also got to see a lot of contaminants, plenty of single-use plastic materials and other waste. All of that ends in our faraway mountains, and at the moment, there are not enough social enterprises able to introduce a circular economy system. In Dubai, despite its various problems, I got to see sustainable enterprises subsidized by the government. In Dubai, I got to experience sustainable means of transportation and living. In Dubai, I'm still learning about how to approach local challenges and make it a thriving nation and economy from a place built on a desert with its unique challenges. Peru is one of the greenest places on earth having fertile lines and a strong people keen to have a better lifestyle. We just need some decentralized thinking and prioritize the well-being of each member of society. Are you up for the challenge? Thank you. Thank you, Vanya, for your testimony and the powerful message that you'd have to present. <clears throat> to all member states, it's a pleasure to have you here. I would pass the floor to Ms. Elizabeth Mulling-Smith for her intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for having me t um, today. And I would like to um, express a, a different approach and um, in, in terms of what my um, heritage country has done in engaging its diaspora. So I represent Jamaica, and um, I sit on the, the Global Jamaica Diaspora Council. My portfolio is development, and I will explain that as we go along. The Jamaica, like all other Caribbean states, do have direct impact of climate change. Our food security, water security, energy security are all compromised, as well as uh, aspects of our economy, namely our, our agricultural sectors and tourism sectors, which are directly affected. But we also have a, a wide diaspora network, and our diaspora range from the UK, where I, I am a member of the diaspora there, the UK, and the US, Canada, um, several countries on the African continent, several countries within Southeast Asia, and in India, and also in Antarctica. So, we do travel the world, and we do bring our cultural paradigm with us. I set that to set the scene as to why it's important for our host country's um, approach and uh, also the reason why they sought to change the relationship. So in the past, the only connection with the diaspora has been through remittances and remittances in response to emergency situations such as following a hurricane and or major storm event um, or any other natural disaster. And what we collectively said within the diaspora is that we can offer much more. The intellectual capital of my heritage country, Jamaica, is quite strong outside of, of the island as it is inside of the island. The, the issue is how to have you know, the appropriate pathways to connect the two so we can effectively enable growth and development of Jamaica. And this is what the, the government of Jamaica and opposition had um, decided to uh, develop. We have a global Jamaica Diaspora Council with elected representatives from the, the larger diaspora groups in Canada, the US, and the United Kingdom. We also have sector representatives for different thematic areas which are important to the growth and development of Jamaica. I represent a sector area, so I'm a sector lead for development. And what that means is that I act as an advocate and to work with my uh, country representatives, whether the ministry, department, and agencies, to enable different aspects of development. I also act as a conduit between my host country 
and my heritage country to enable relationships that will invoke change, will invoke a stronger development platform, and also will enable the, the voiceless. And I'm when I talk about the voiceless, I'm talking about communities who often are, are not incorporated in the agenda. One of the main issues that I'd like to table today is the importance of holistic policy making. And this goes across the board. I use my own country as a, an example because we have brought it to the fore that it is important for us as we move forward, as we develop, as we approach 2030, and as we truly embrace the SDGs, that we have a holistic approach to uh, our policy setting. Within climate change and a climate change agenda, because of our geographic position, we are directly impacted by all the classic examples of climate change, whether it be storm events, drought, sea level rise, we are affected as an island state. And because of this, everything that we do at ministerial level in terms of setting policy across the various ministerial portfolios is important to have this joint approach and having joint conversations. Policy setting in water security has a direct impact on policy setting in food security and vice versa. There's a nexus between the policies of water, energy, and uh, food security, and that needs to be embraced across the board. We are not going to achieve what we need to achieve for our communities and safeguarding the future development platform of our countries, and I speak for Jamaica and other, other small island states who are in a similar situation, we are not going to achieve it if we do not have this holistic approach to um, policy setting. And if that, that's one main point I would like to meet, leave here today in terms of my testimony and what I bring on behalf of our diaspora uh, group. We also, by embracing this and um, acting as advocates for this, this approach, uh, try to eliminate the co conflict of policies and how these affect the, co the communities on the ground. We are, we're in climate change, as we all know, is, is not a, a future thing. We're living in it and we're living in it now. In my country, we have been going through the, the pains of this for a substantial period of time. The recent COP, um, COP27 discussions on loss and damage are also important for the security and sustainability of the, those communities and the growth and development of my heritage country. So I'd like to leave as a, a main development point the importance of this holistic approach to policy setting. This is key and this is a main concern from the diaspora group. We see the benefits of it and as the small development states know the, the impact of uh, this joint conversation is immense and far reaching. I will probably um, have further questions um, later on to answer. Uh, I would just like to leave that there because I think that is the main message on behalf of my diaspora group that I am mandated to bring to you today. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. <clears throat> and, as the, and as the voices of the diaspora are extremely important to IOM, to our work and, and the success of, of moving forward these thematics, I would like to invite our final uh, panelist to uh, speak, uh, Ms. Cristel Sil Sicana, which I think will join us also online. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. First of all, I really want to thank um, all those who put this panel together because I believe this is an extremely important uh, conversation that we need to have. It's really important that we start opening up the spaces 
uh, to migrants, migrants' descent, and our community members um, in order to ensure that no one is being left behind. So to the question of how African diaspora um, or Africans or migrant youth communities um, are being affected by climate change in Europe, but also abroad. Um, first of all, I'm from Cameroon, um, but I have been, I've been living my whole life here in Belgium, but I have spent a lot of time researching and doing some work across um, on the African continent. And um, I want to stress the fact that the impact and the context um, totally varied on how people are affected. So it definitely starts with people at home, people in Africa, in order to motivate why people do move, because I think this is really important that um, for people to understand. So before even arriving in Europe, um, Africans, people on the African continent um, are being ex um, exposed to floods, droughts, hurricanes. And across the, the last years, we have seen how a lot of uh, people have been moving or have been forcefully displaced, uh, such as in Nigeria, where like millions have been displaced um, with recent floods. And I want to share just two stories here of two people I met in my um, uh, most recent trip, which was in Senegal. And um, I want to share their stories. So I met um, Yassin Day, which is, who is a transformatrice, as we say in French. So she's a fish uh, producer, transformer. And she is living at the coastal line of Senegal, and her house is the only one still standing there in her city at the coastal line. With the rising sea levels, all of the houses has been destroyed. A, lot, a huge part of her house has been destroyed, and many were forced to move out of there. But she's still there. When I asked her why she was still there, um, despite the threat that the sea is posing, she told me it's because I have no choice. It's because I have nothing left. It's because I have nowhere else to go. A lot of people at the coastal line in Senegal are experiencing this threat. And what is also happening here is um, at the moment of when I was visiting her, um, there has been a past days intense rain and a whole the whole site where those, those women are active and producing fish has been um, was flooded. So for the past for a whole month or weeks, this woman haven't been able to work. The another story I want to share with you also the story of a young person, which is um, who is Musa. Musa is a fisherman also uh, from Senegal, but then in the other city, Saint Louis. And he actually um, tried to go to Spain. So he has been he had he had been stranded for five days on the sea in the Senegal um, with 50 people on the boat, and um, where people died on the boat. Uh, they had no food, and he made it to Morocco. He wasn't able to make it to make it to Spain. And when I asked him if he could, would he do it do it again? He said yes, despite the fact that he has been. Um, sent back to Senegal, despite all the risks that he has experienced, he will try it again because he has he wants to provide a better future for his family. And he believes that it's at the other side of the world that he had to that he has to go there. So the reason also why Musa was moving is because um they, they were fishing, they were experiencing a lack um, of fish. So they weren't um, fishing as much as before. And there is a lot of comp competition with um, Asians and European who are, who are present on the seas. So they are not benefiting from their own resources, which is something that we really need to start addressing. So as we can see, and as we all know, the, the, the economic part and, and the climate change part is really intertwined and we cannot dissociate both, which is also a lot of the reason why people move. And it, as for those who are able to reach Europe, and as we see, for example, right now in Belgium, a lot of migrants right now are stranded on the streets. We can, if you pass um, the streets in Brussels, for example, you see a lot of migrants living on the streets, um, sleeping there. And um, we have one of the park, biggest one, which is called Park Maximilian, uh, where a lot of migrants are just being left stranded there. A lot of these migrants are migrants in transit. We're trying to reach the UK, and a lot of them are coming from Eastern Africa, so Eritrean, Somalian, etc. And the reason is because of the language barrier, but also because they have their family over there and because they had they didn't have anything anymore or having experienced drought, severe drought in their countries, they were forced 
um, to move. So the, those people who are like migrants in transit are not benefiting from the governmental protection. They are not being taken in charge by the government and also by international protection. And uh, what's happening right now, like I was saying earlier, those people, um, those migrants um, are left uh, stranded in the street. What is happening in Brussels is like a lot of the problems that we are experiencing are then blamed onto migrants. So there is like this kind of demon demonization of migrants, um, of immigration in, um, in Europe, in Belgium. So this is like an other level of like what is happening to African communities, so not only in Africa, but then also in, um, in once they arrive in Belgium. But then there is also a, a last one that I want to share, which is then people of migrant descent. So who have been living here for their whole life, generations um, present here for the past generations, who have been present in Belgium, raised, lived in Belgium of African descent. Those one ex also experience um, climate change, but then in a different way, which is where they are not only experiencing environmental racism. So one of the, the the report that has been published, which is the first one on environmental justice, for example, in um, in France, um, says that most of the communities were living near um, incineration, ma waste management uh, sites are those from um, immigration, those from migration, descent, and those people are being um, are being exposed to all the emissions that comes with it. And when you have this climate crisis that's happening right now, rising temperature, et cetera, which is trapping emissions, et cetera, it is also directly impacting their health, but also the, the way they are living. Um, another example is, for example, this, those communities are also, for example, not benefiting, for example, flood, defen flood defenses um, in order to protect their houses, their homes um, for eventually floods. Uh, they're not having access to, to, to green spaces, which is which then during the summer, um, when it, when you have those heat waves, um, it's working against them. And when you are, they're trying to use, for example, fans or whatsoever, or even right now, because it's super cold, you want to put the heater on with the increasing electricity bill, um, knowing that a lot of this, um, people of racialized communities are also um, having lower incomes. Um, They're not able to afford all of that. And when you look at, for example, all the, the, the um, electricity, the European Green Deal, electricity plants, transition plants, you can see how those communities, racialized communities are not taken into account when the decisions are being developed. And I think this is something that we really need to start paying attention to and we are trying to do um, through um, uh, uh, African Union Diaspora Youth Initiative, but also um, other diaspora youth organizations who, who are present here um, in Belgium, but not enough is being done. So there is a problem uh, that is plural, so the context, the demonization of immigration, multicultural Cultural is there is environmental racism, but definitely the absence of mainstreaming racialized communities in policy debates in Europe and policy papers. There is a lack of involvement and engagement, not only um, in Africa, but definitely um, a lot here in Europe when it comes to involving racialized communities in decision making processes, uh, debates, etc. So while there is a lot of attention paid, um, little attention, sorry, paid to how members of racialized communities are affected by climate change and how they feel um, in, for example, pre in pre predominantly white um, spaces in Europe, most of the data um, that has been produced, for example, um, and that we are producing has been done by um, racial people from racialized communities from diaspora. So, Diaspora is really contributing, Diaspora Youth is really contributing in raising awareness and, and making sure that their voices are being heard, but not enough is being done because they still need to have access to that space um, that will make sure that their, their voices is really being taken into account into the decisions and being implemented, adopted into the, um, the policies being developed, action plans being developed. So I definitely want to share some of the organizations who are doing tremendous work on um, raising award, awareness on um, 
the, the situations of diaspora. So not only the African Diaspora Youth Organization, which is working closely with the AU permanent mission um, to the EU on working on the Agenda 2063, for example, looking towards how um, diaspora can contribute to to, um, to, for example, economical development um, on the African continent, so addressing this brain drain gap. Um, but definitely, I feel that there is an urge for European institutions to start also having this conversation with diaspora youth organization, which is not done um, a lot, uh, way too little. And then there is other diaspora youth organizations such as ENAR, which would were developing reports on um, the intersection of climate justice, racial justice, neocolonials. I think it's very important that we start um, addressing and, and decolonizing uh, policies and spaces in order to make sure that um, everyone is being taken into account. This inclusive aspect is, real, is really being implemented. And then you have one for two diaries. I said was really making sure it's EF, sorry, it was really making sure that um, grassroots communities on the African continent have, it, have access to uh, decision making uh, processes and really can actually talk for themselves. And also another organization in France, uh, which is called Get Up, which is was raising awareness and trying to bridge the gap and, and really trying to um, really change this narrative that actually what app, what um what um if i can say it that way what people um why people are experiencing um as climate change in europe is not the same as what um people racialized communities are experiencing it they are trying to sit more with uh people from other um background, cultural background to really share more about it. It's really important that we start bridging this gap and really start listening to, it, to each other and, and realize that the way that we're experiencing climate change is not the same way as others are experiencing it. And then finally, I just want to say um, it's very important that we start looking into um, changing the narrative and, and, and how we we pictured migrants. Migrants aren't more than just migrants. Those are people, individuals who have a lot of skills and have a lot to contribute. As we can see, for example, in South of Spain, how migrants are, culture, are contributing to the uh, agricultural sector. Um, but the aspect of definitely of the, the, the rights being violated really needs to be addressed. But they are contributing into entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, um, et cetera. So there is, a lot, there is a lot of skills here. We have a lot of skills and much to offer and much to contribute to. But we need to be given that space. We need to be given, um, um, yeah, the tools in order to be able to do that. We need to create the right conditions um, for, for, for migrants in order to contribute. We need to start seeing migra migration as an adaptive solution instead of being seen as a threat. And it definitely starts with the way we tell the stories, the way the story, the way it is shown, for example, in media or the way it's being communicated to um, so definitely actions, um, decision, and also want to stress the fact that actions and decisions taken in Europe affect migrants, racialized communities, but also directly and indirectly affect people on the ground, as, for example, um, fishermen in Africa. So we really need to start addressing all of that. If we don't do this, um, if we do not address this, it's not only the global hub, it's not only Africa, but it also racialized communities in Europe, we will continue to bear the brunt of, um, of the climate crisis. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Christelle, for your works and those very poignant uh, stories from Senegal. We would like to invite any of the member states now, if they have raised a question to address uh, to any of the panelists, any pressing question, please uh, take the floor. Otherwise, we will proceed. <laughs> There's a very long agenda for today, but we would like to invite anyone that has a pressing question to be able to do so now. There is a question on the second floor. Thank you very much. Um, I'm with the United States, and thank you to all the panelists for your very... Um, informative presentations, and especially from the diaspora perspective. But I was wondering if I could ask our colleague um, from Peru, who obviously is quite energetic and quite passionate about the issues. 
I'm wondering what the um, indigenous population in Peru is doing in terms of the Venezuelans who have found their way uh, to safety in Peru in terms of helping them adapt uh, and integrate into Peru. Thank you so much. And just to make sure, like, you are meaning something about the government who is making towards helping indigenous communities? I think it's, it's more about what the indigenous communities themselves might be able to do in terms of helping the government understand the challenges of migration. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. So, uh, first of all, I think like indigenous communities nowadays are trying to prosper. Like for example, they are trying to have the sustainable enterprises that I was showing you, but not only that, they are also trying to have job led initiatives within the indigenous communities themselves. However, as you, mo most of you know, like these things require time, which we may have, but also require a quantity of money which usually these communities doesn't have that much. So usually we do everything we can from our sources, but as well we need some support from the government, right? So for example, like there was a big um, like draw, let's say, or every year what happens is like rocks start falling on the highways while people pass by. So what they did is just basically put a big contemplating stuff, but not only that, because that's not prevention, that's something like happens as a consequence. So what they were doing is, okay, we're looking at the causes. We're discussing this to fall, the rain. Okay, how can we prevent the rain from happening? We cannot, right? So we need to tackle this issue. They created canals to make the rain to go other ways. So these ways are not happening to throw the rocks behind it. It's just such a simple way to prevent some, like, big things from happening and unwanted deaths. But, again, this requires money, right? So we are doing everything we can from our sources to prevent some, such things. But we also need the help from the government. And not only the government, but international organizations as cooperation. And generally, this stuff needs also organization among us. But that doesn't happen much of the time, you know, because one of the time, the government, most of them, not all, obviously, is speaking Spanish. So when a person goes to these areas, how are they going to communicate with indigenous communities if the indigenous communities speak their own language and the government speaks Spanish? This is a miscommunication. You can say interpreters. Okay, that requires money. Who can provide those interpreters? Indigenous communities? No. Who can or who should provide these interpreters? And again, this is a big issue because of the miscommunication stuff. And this is something that we are willing to work into, but we also, indigenous communities, need help. Thank you, Vanya. I would like to make sure there is no other further questions from the floor. I, Colombia has the floor. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Vanya, for your presentation. And, and I would like to ask you if you continue in contact with, your, with the Consulate of Peru or with the Embassy of Peru in order to continue to promote what you've just mentioned about the importance of indigenous uh, population and languages and if you are promoting it from the government side too. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, that query. And yeah, generally, if I'm not misinterpreting your question, it's just basically how I am engaging within these communities nowadays. Okay. So it's just basically like, first of all, I think everything starts from knowing what's going on. Because, for example, maybe you all didn't know a lot of realities that we all share as panelists today. So, first of all, I work on awareness. Later, awareness is not everything. This is the first step for me. So, later on, we have to make actions. So, for example, what, what I am doing nowadays. Uh, as I said before, uh, nowadays I'm living in Dubai, and most of my friends or people I knew in Dubai, people I work with closely in leadership, they didn't know what's going on in Peru. I opened their eyes, and we are working closely with these communities. For example, next year, uh, I'm planning also to go to these indigenous communities to teach them something, because most of us, like, we don't, generally speaking, we don't have much education. And if you are lucky enough, you get to finish elementary school. But again, you need to ride horses or llamas or donkeys or whatever. And a lot of people and children die every single year because of this. So I think education should be provided not only as mean to get okay and like just say we are providing education, but make it accessible. 
to these people, right? Make them accessible. So this is something that I look forward to working into next year, um, going back to one of these indigenous communities in Puno, specifically in Peru, and help them with education, which is much needed, right? And with the expertise and everything that I have learned throughout my short period of life, because I am 20 years old, I hope to make a difference because I know I'm not going to change the whole reality, but if at least I can change the life of one single person, I think people are just like candles. If you only turn out one candle, this one candle can help turn it on more. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Vanya. Um, a last question. The UK has the floor. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of our panelists who have spoken so uh, passionately and so clearly uh, this morning. We really welcome uh, your incredible insights uh, to, to us all sitting here in council. My question, I think, was uh, specifically to, to Ms. Milling-Smith, if I may. Um, you mentioned a lot in your testimony about focusing on the role of the diaspora as a bridge and making policy making holistic. I was wondering, particularly for the UK, where we have a large number of diaspora communities, can you give any sort of practical examples or steps or best practice about how we could try and harness the, the diaspora as agents of change? Thank you. Thanks very much, if I may. And um, a very, very good um, rounded question. The, you are right, uh, the United Kingdom has uh, quite a, a depth and breadth of diaspora communities and has a very large Jamaican diaspora com community, which I am a part of. An, an aspect or an area that um, the, the government of the United Kingdom can harness the, the, um, the strength and potential of the diaspora is to reach out to these, these um, diaspora hub groups because the intellectual um, capacity and um, the, um, the potential of the, the diaspora community is vast and for those of us who have made, um, in, in this case, United Kingdom a part of our, our, our host country um, and settled there and are contributing, we act as that bridge to um, our heritage country. And giving you an example of that, when we had issues associated with, and again, um, spoke, focusing on climate change, the um, hurricanes that occur in um, the Caribbean region, the understanding and contextualization of the experience and the concerns and the real issues can, can be um, obtained and um, enabled through the diaspora voices and the diaspora communities. We, we do have experience in, in engineering and um, in e economics, and therefore have real tangible experiences to link back to the, the issue related to our um, heritage country or other, and in this case, other um, island states, um, small island development states. The, the issue is that there is a, um, a lack of connectivity between the um, host country and the diaspora community in this regard. And um, we, we have through our diaspora council, so we have a Jamaican diaspora council, and we use that as a, a platform of engagement. And as I mentioned early on, we do have um, very strong uh, elected groups in the United Kingdom, in Canada, and in the, US, um, the USA. And they do act as the um, focal points for both the diaspora community and the, uh, the state or the um, government agencies. I, for one, have uh, worked with and alongside the FCDO in uh, crisis situations associated with um, uh, climate events. And that's just one example. And many of my colleagues do operate on various levels throughout um, 
the government departments and agencies within the United Kingdom. And the aim of that is to, one, un to unlock the, um, the intellectual capital that exists within the diaspora community um, and to, to have that galvanized you know, within the, um, the solution creation for um, issues of um, you know, bilateral agreements or um, looking at uh, policy influence or, or even large-scale projects to invoke change and to enable growth and development. So these are real tangible um, areas where the, the diaspora and the, the, the diaspora voices represent so much more because, you know, we are um, elected or selected to serve our communities and our host countries. So we, we do act as a, um, a source of knowledge in regards to our own uh, countries or, and um, other small island states, but also because of our experiences within our host countries, um, act as a, a, a conduit or a link between the um, heritage and, and the host countries on, on aspects that um, are requiring um, change in terms of, you know, the, um, the narrative on uh, specific areas of concern and um, the uh, development issues associated with the um, intervention from our host countries. So. Um, it is, it is in, in a period of growth, and we certainly would like to see more interaction of our the host countries with the diaspora and communities, and in particular in the United Kingdom, that we have um, greater um, association and, and uh, conversation to enable um, change both in country and the communities up and, up and down um, the United Kingdom from as far as, as um, Elgin in Scotland to the Scilly Isles. Um, we, we have Jamaican um, diaspora. So I, I hope that uh, provides uh, the context and some background to um, support your, your question. And um, I'm quite happy to have further discussions if necessary after. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, as we conclude, allow me just to summarize a bit of the discussions today, um, noting that we heard today from governments in the voice of Dr. Henry from the CVS on issues related with climate justice and supporting the most vulnerable communities, but also on how human mobility is critical to adaptation and to reduction, reducting the worst impacts of loss and damage, that CVF is committed to working with IOM on such, including all the member states. We also heard from Vanya as a youth representative a very strong and powerful testimony on climate, how climate change is impacting individuals and communities in the Andes. Inclusion, opportunities, and local solutions on our voice are way forward to address the impacts of climate change, environmental degradation, and migration. From Elizabeth, we had the opportunity to discuss diaspora, understanding how intellectual cap capital is a resource that can be used to foster growth, but also the importance of having policy coherence and overlapping risks understanding to design policies that are offering solutions, particular for seeds, where a priority needs to, priorities need to continue to foster the sustainable development growth in a way that includes the diaspora on the processes of building this growth. And we all heard from Cristel on the impacts of disasters compelling people to move and on how the role of migration pathways is critical to ensure that people have opportunities, ensuring their participation on policy development and cooperation to achieve these. To, summer, to end, IOM continues to be an inclusive, diverse, and agile organization that has and continues to build strong partnerships and will continue to work with individuals and communities across the world to ensure that we can contribute to address the worst impacts of climate change, environmental degradation, and disasters. Without further ado, this item is now coming to a close. I wish to thank the speakers for this morning and the participants' questions. 
Uh, and we will now continue with agenda item 12. In a few moments, the general debate will continue. Thank you so much.
Uh, good morning. I, I think it is still morning. Um, uh, and welcome back. We will now continue with the general debate. Um, again, a customary reminder to speakers of the time allocated, which is three minutes for member states and one and a half minutes for observers. To ensure the smooth running of the meeting, I would also like to request that all those taking the floor speak at a reasonable pace to allow for accurate translation, in particular if delegates are uh, participating online. In all cases, to ensure accurate and clear uh, translation, copies of all statements should be submitted in advance by all delegations to the meeting secretariat before the opening of the relevant morning or afternoon session. Uh, and so I now give the floor to Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran. You have the floor. Excellency. Good morning to all colleagues. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Mr. Chairperson, the negative impact of climate change, the consequences of intercontinental military interventions, and the global economic crisis have universally aggravated the humanitarian situation and provoked a huge population's involuntary movement across the world. The current situation in Afghanistan is, is, is a testament to how political ambitions of some wealthy states are leading to new geopolitical challenges and make unprecedented suffering for people in the move in the migrant countries of origin and transit as well as their host communities. Host communities in developing countries are paying the cost of migration on behalf of developed states who are the last destination of displaced people. Tackling the humanitarian challenges needs a broad political will, mostly by the main actors who made this situation. Taking a holistic political approach is a prerequisite to the whole of society and the whole of government approach in covering all needs of people on the move in developing countries. Since multilateralism failed to find a viable solution to international disputes, high politics have flowed into the low politics, in particular the humanitarian atmosphere. By conducting enhanced humanitarian diplomacy, we must try our best to prevent humanitarian space from being more contaminated by politics. In absence of this holistic approach, the financial gap in international humanitarian organizations will be increasingly aggravated, and developing countries of transit, such as Iran, couldn't afford all costs of hosting by their own limited resources anymore. Mr. Chairperson, the Islamic Republic of Iran as an origin as well as long temporary transit and destination for migrants has done its utmost to provide immigrants with more than necessary services regardless of their legal status. Iranian host communities have been sharing their major resources and means of livelihood with migrants for the last four decades. Notwithstanding DG's report on the settling trend of humanitarian shock inside Afghanistan, the irregular influx of Afghan nationals to the neighboring countries, including mine, remains shocking. We must not let the new humanitarian crisis consign the most prolonged one in oblivion. The Islamic Republic of Iran in spite of its narrowed hosting capacity due to the unlawful unilateral coercive measures, has not spared any effort to protect the displaced persons, in particular during and in the aftermath of the COVID pandemic beyond the call of duty, some of which I will refer to. Registration of more than 700,000 students in public schools 380,000 of whom are undocumented Afghans. Education of 58,000 university students, 
holding literacy courses for 190,000 foreign illiterate students. Free insurance coverage under a special public health insurance scheme for 157,000 of vulnerable refugees while providing access for all displaced persons to register in the public health insurance scheme. Implementation of the national, of national, of nationwide vaccination of foreign national against COVID-19, regardless of their legal status. And granting Iranian nationality to more than 10,000 children born to Iranian mothers and foreign fathers to cope with statelessness. Mr. Chairperson, my delegation recognizes the IOM's commitment as part and parcel of its professional approach to scaling up its staffing and operations in Iran following the revitalization of the IOM office in Tehran. We also acknowledge the additional budget allocated to IOM's projects in Iran. While appreciating the generosity of some donors, we reiterate the need for implementing policies by IOM to ensure the full realization of the budget alongside the allocation of more funds to meet the least requirements of hosting and managing migration. Aligned with the statement of the Asia-Pacific Group, we hope that the organization would take effective steps to promote a well-balanced and inclusive approach to equitable geographical representation, in particular in the senior management. Allow me to conclude by expressing our commitment to supporting the organization to ensure a fit-for-purpose organization to rise to the challenges associated with its humanitarian mandate. I thank you. Thank you, uh, Excellency. Um, I have Zambia. You have the floor. Thank you, Chairperson. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, on behalf of the delegation of the Republic of Zambia, allow me to join other speakers before me in congratulating you, Ambassador, on your election as Chairperson of the Bureau. My delegation also congratulates you, Chairperson, for the manner in which you have so far guided this meeting since we started last week, uh, early this week. Let me also take this opportunity to thank His Excellency, the Director General of the IOM, for his very detailed and informative report, which gave an overview of the organization's significant achievements in 2022, IOM's role in the various humanitarian situations around the world, IOM's work to support capacity building across the globe, as well as the IOM's investment in early warning and preparedness in order to anticipate crisis. Chairperson, I wish to align my statement to the statement delivered by the distinguished representative of Nigeria on behalf of the African group. Allow me also to join others in congratulating Barbados on becoming a member of the International Organization for Migration. Chairperson, the government of the Republic of Zambia is concerned about the impact of climate induced migration and its effects on livelihoods. My delegation believes that practical, timely and appropriate measures in migration and climate change will help in the safeguarding of human welfare and consequently the protection of human rights as well as the environment. My delegation takes cognizance of the complex nexus between migration, environment and climate change. Indeed, climate change is a multiplier to migration. This integrate relationship with development, as we all are aware, currently is amongst the most pressing challenges that have dominated Africa's social economic development debate. In this regard, the Zambian government has prioritized the implementation of the national migration policy in line with its national development plans. Following the development and launch of the National Migration Profile and the Migration Governance Indicators Assessment Report, the Zambian government decided to develop a national migration policy underpinned by the Global Compact for Safe 
orderly and regular migration and the African Union and Southern African Development Community Model Frameworks. Chairperson, in a quest to strengthen national mechanisms for preparedness, resilience, res res response to forced migration, and to effectively manage internal migration for social economic development, the Zambian government is strengthening the coordination and capacity of institutions to better address forced migration, promoting social economic rights of forced migrants, promoting institutional coordination on internal migration, and strengthening the capacity of local authorities to respond to internal migration, among other measures. Chairperson, climate change impacts, particularly sudden, sudden climatic events such as floods and tropical cyclones, result in instant displacement of people from affected areas. These climatic events undoubtedly uh, affect national budget lines, putting pressure on already stretched fiscal space. In addressing climate change, the government of Zambia is undertaking some measures, including the reviewing of the national policy on climate change of 2016, in order to make it responsive to the current situation, developing a climate change bill, which will provide legal backing for an effective national response to climate change, as well as developing a national adaptation plan, which will provide long-term adaptation measures to respond to impacts of climate change and many other measures. As states, we have a mammoth task at hand, but with each state doing its part, we can all help in managing forced migration occasioned by climate change. My delegation is of the firm belief that with serious concerted efforts by all stakeholders, concrete solutions can and will be found on climate change and adaptation and resilience measures, which will address the challenges that many countries, particularly in Africa, are facing. In concluding, I wish to reiterate Zambia's commitment to the IOM. Permit me to also echo the sentiments by Nigeria on behalf of the African group in commending His Excellency, Mr. Antonio Vitorino, and the entire leadership of the IOM for their efforts towards enhancing the efficiency of IOM in fulfilling the objectivities of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. I thank you for your kind attention. And I thank you, Zambia. Thank you very much. Um, Jordan, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Excellency. Uh, allow me at the outset to thank the Director General for presenting his annual report very detailed and informative one indeed, and to congratulate the newly appointed members of the Bureau. Uh, Jordan would like to align uh, itself and its position to what has been expressed by the Arab and the APG groups. Jordan welcomes the selection of this important topic for the high-level segment that addresses the intersection between climate change, food security, migration, and displacement. Indeed, uh, when we talk about carbon imprint, water, food, energy, conflict, policy, law, rule of law, and how it affects uh, movement and displacement, climate change uh, becomes very significant in its consequences and is becoming increasingly dangerous, a dangerous reality that needs to be confronted and addressed at both national and international policy level. Jordan is among one of the most affected countries in the world by climate change, in particular in the water <laughs> sector area. Jordan is one of the most water-scarce countries in the world due to the semi-arid climate system and the high temperatures. Thus, the severe pressure on our, on our limited resources, exacerbated by the abnormal increase in population growth caused by the massive influx of refugees, is the biggest obstacle to economic development and growth in Jordan and affects all of our national policies and plans. Jordan is a country of around 11 million people and is hosting 3 points, around 3.6 million refugees. The combination of climate change and population growth increased by the influx of those large numbers of refugees 
are both expected to place further strain on Jordan's scarce resources, especially water. The UN recognized that global refugees and their host countries are among the most vulnerable to climate change. To address this crisis, Jordan has put forward the Climate Refugee Nexus Initiative that was launched by His Majesty King Abdullah II during COP27 that took place in Sharm el-Sheikh lately. Its purpose is to support host countries that bear the brunt of climate change. We welcome and invite the support of all countries to endorse this important initiative. Oh, but also, Jordan's Green Recovery Program goes hand in hand with our economic modernization vision. We are making the most of our country's significant solar and wind resources. Jordan is a leader in the region in clean energy production, with 29% of electricity powered by renewables. Mr. Chair, climate change is a global scourge that concerns us all, and one of the drivers of successful climate action is strong collaboration at the global and regional levels, as well as between the public and private sectors, in order to target opportunities and align resources and capabilities. One critical area is financing for developing countries to mitigate and adapt to climate negative impacts on displacement and migration. Finally, we would like to commend IOM for its flexibility and important contributions in response to the pandemic. It's not over yet, but we're still addressing it, and we value all the efforts that all international organizations, including IOM, has done in this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jordan. Um, I have a Salvador. Oh, you have the floor. Uh, Salvador, please. Thank you very much, Chair, for giving us the floor. First of all, the delegation of El Salvador would like to congratulate you on your election, and we welcome the other members of this multilateral space. We are certain that under your leadership we will achieve significant results on, the, on migration. We also align ourselves with this statement by Grulak and join in congratulating Barbados for the admission as a member. My country appreciates the support, joint work and financing that the IOM and the Director General, Mr. Antonio Vittorino, have offered in the face of the changing dynamics of migration, in particular the efforts in tackling the effects of climate on, as drivers of migration. El Salvador, which is a country of origin, transit, to destination and return, considers that human mobility is a right that should be seen as an option and not an obligation. Therefore, our president, Nayib Bukele, has set a priority of providing assistance, protection, and welfare for Salvadorians, whatever the place and migratory status that they are in. And we recognize the Global Compact on Migration as an essential mechanism for tackling, in, uh, tackling migration in a comprehensive and human way. As a champion country since uh, January 2020, we have worked uh, with commitment to achieve the actions to protect the dignity and human rights of all migrant populations, tackling the structural causes of irregular migration. We are concerned by the continuous difficulties facing migrants to access uh, humanitarian assistance in the transit and arrival processes and the needs of the cases of unaccompanied minors and families that are going through reunification and the lack of the application of fair and human treatments instead of detention. The government is making great efforts to tackle migration subjects. For instance, our labor migration program of the Foreign Affairs Ministry between September 21 and August 2022 helped a total of 2,800 workers creating regular migration routes to preserve the life of our population. We are also fighting against cross-border organized crime in particular and the crimes related to migration, such as the illicit trafficking of migrants and uh, people trafficking. The 
territorial control plan strategy implemented by the government has achieved substantial results to guarantee the security of our population. In the presidency, the pro-temporary presidency of the regional migration conference, El Salvador has promoted the human sense of mobility. And on the 29th of November in San Salvador, we held the regional consultation meeting on migration with 11 countries participating, international organizations, civil society, and other relevant stakeholders. And the aim was to have a space for political and technical dialogue on migration to share information, experiences, and best practice. To conclude, we recognize the positive contributions of migrants, in particular of young people and women, in the development of our countries, as well as the contributions received from international organizations, civil society, and other important stakeholders for our work to achieve safe, orderly, and regular migration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Bulgaria, you have the floor. Distinguished Chairperson, Director General Vitorino, distinguished delegates, Bulgaria aligns with the EU statement and the statement made by Ukraine on behalf of a group of countries. We note with concern that in 2022 the displacement continues reaching new record levels and state our support to IOM's tireless work to assist those in need. We highlight particularly IOM's action in Ukraine and Afghanistan aimed at providing assistance and access to basic services and healthcare support to IDPs and returnees. Russia's war of aggression on Ukraine provoked a huge displacement and a humanitarian crisis in Europe and created a deepening food insecurity worldwide, with the continuing targeted destruction of Ukraine's critical civilian infrastructure, many tens of thousands and maybe millions of internally displaced persons in the country will need help to get through the coldest months of the upcoming winter. It is heartening to hear that IOM is already ramping up its winterization support to help people prepare for what will come. We share IOM's approach to meet not only the humanitarian needs, but also support sustainable livelihoods and work with the Ukrainian authorities and communities to rebuild and promote community stabilization. Bulgaria also appreciates IOM's action in the application of whole of society, whole of Syria approach in addressing the humanitarian situation in Syria, including provision of services for rapid recovery of local communities, child protection, and prevention of violence against women. We hope that in this regard, Bulgaria's voluntary contribution has been helpful for the IOM mission on the ground. Mental health and psychological support to displaced people and communities affected by war are important part of IOM's work and should be encouraged, as well as the continued aid to persons in vulnerable situations, especially women, children, and persons with disabilities. Climate change and its devastating effects have serious humanitarian consequences in terms of food security, welfare of communities, and economic security. IOM is in a unique position to respond to the escalating humanitarian and development needs related to human mobility in the context of natural disasters, and we support its work in this regard. Bulgaria continues to support the ongoing process of IOM internal reforms. We hope that the IOM leadership will use the newly agreed increase of IOM budget for further and better progress in the implementation of the business transformation and the strengthening of the results-based management. As regards human resources, Bulgaria welcomes the tireless efforts and the impressive work of IOM staff to be always on their posts, fearless and devoted to their mission. We can only encourage IOM's management to strengthen the care for their welfare and mental health. We also value IOM as our key partner on the national level in areas such as return, reintegration and integration of foreigners, in raising public awareness about migration policies and in efforts to combat human trafficking. Improving the effectiveness of the return policy of illegal residents is one of the priorities in our migration policy, with a clear emphasis on promoting the voluntary nature of this process. The support that the IOMA, IOMA, IOM is providing us in, the, in this respect is of key importance to Bulgaria. I thank you. And I thank you, uh, Excellency. I now yield the floor to the Director General to make some comments. 
Thank you, so, <clears throat> thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning to all of you. I would like to uh, start by saying, uh, uh, in response to the uh, uh, Islamic Republic of Iran, that uh, IOM uh, uh, operates in full alignment with uh, the humanitarian principles of independence, neutrality, and uh, impartiality. And uh, we have been scaling up uh, our mission in Tehran precisely because we do recognize that the events that have occurred in Afghanistan represent uh, an extra flow of people towards the Islamic Republic. And uh, we uh, appreciate particularly the reforms that have been uh, introduced in Iran by the uh, institution of uh, the National Migration Agency that uh, is uh, a critical counterpart of IOM uh, in, the, in the country. And uh, we value uh, the need to have a close cooperation in terms of uh, adapting and building the resilience of the communities for the impacts uh, of uh, climate change in the Islamic Republic of Iran, and you can count on our support in that uh, respect. When it comes to Zambia, I would like to uh, express our engagement with the Zambian government in dealing with uh, the, the diaspora uh, agenda of the government, and we welcome the amendment of the legislation that has allowed dual citizenship in Zambia, precisely as a key milestone towards enabling and empowering diaspora nationals as agents of development in the country. And from our side, you can go on counting on our support and expertise and advice in the revision of uh, your national migration policy, as well as uh, the pioneer examples that Zambia has in terms of linking human mobility and trade in the framework of the common market for Eastern and Southern Africa, the COMESA. In relation to Jordan, I will emphasize once again uh, in this year the uh, generosity uh, of the Jordan authorities to uh, sustain the assistance uh, to refugees, particularly to the refugees uh, from uh, uh, Syria. And uh, we uh, intend to go on working uh, closely with UNHCR and with the government in Jordan in order to uh, provide resettlement to those uh, refugees that are in his territory. It's particularly relevant for us in Jordan, the commitment taken by the Ministry of Health of eliminating tuberculosis as a public health problem in the country by 2030 and including migrants, refugees and vulnerable communities in this objective, thereby achieving SDG target 3.3 and we cooperate closely with the World Health Organization in this respect. In relation to El Salvador's uh, statement, I'd like to congratulate them on their leadership during the pro-temporary uh, presidency of the Regional Migration Conference, as well as on the adoption of their domestic plan uh, for the national migration plan, which is totally linked to the global compact on migration and with the sustainable development goals of the Agenda 2030. The representative of El Salvador mentioned the implementation of uh, labor migration programs, which we are interested in, and of course the fight against uh, people trafficking, which uh, requires uh, and deserves our support. Ukraine, uh, to Bulgaria, I would like to emphasize that uh, we uh, praise the decisions taken by the Bulgarian authorities to uh, receive and support Ukrainian refugees in the country, particularly the efforts for finding accommodation for them, as well as uh, the support that Bulgaria has given us and to our operation in Syria. From our side, we will go on committed with the voluntary return programs that we implement as well as investing in capacity building to Bulgarian border authorities in view of uh, further strengthening Bulgarian readiness to become a full member of the Schengen border-free area. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, and thank you, dear Mr. General. Thank you. Um, I have Paraguay on my list. Paraguay have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. We would like to congratulate you, first of all, on your election to this uh, council, and we also congratulate uh, the other members of the Bureau. Particular greetings to Antonio Vittorino, and we thank him for the presentation of his report, and to the whole team at the IOM for the preparation in these difficult times. Paraguay aligns itself with the uh, statement made by Uruguay on behalf of GRULAC. Chair, the Director General's report sets out how the complex and diverse nature of human mobility today more than ever needs us to work in a coordinated way so we can find effective, sustainable and comprehensive solutions. And we can see that uh, the IOM has strengthened its operative capacity and has ensured that there is financial stability which allows it to respond effectively in a timely manner to all these uh, different scenarios. My country, Paraguay, has also learned lessons, uh, mainly that from a COVID-19 pandemic, and we understand that its need it's necessary to have more agile migratory processes and uh, in line with international treaties and agreements that we have subscribed to. Therefore, we have updated our migratory regulations with a new law, which was approved this year, the law of, on migration, which was uh, adopted uh, just a month and a half ago. This new law allows us to give a greater institutional hierarchy to the General Directorate for Migration, which is uh, becoming a national directorate and depends uh, directly to, uh, on the President of the Republic, and it can set out its own regulations, and it can generate, administer, and invest its own resources. When it comes to human rights, the law sets out principles, guarantees, and rights that the previous uh, laws didn't uh, cover, and it uh, fits with the decree that uh, rules on our policies for migration. I'd also like to highlight the solidarity, cooperation, and coordination that characterize the countries of our region in South America, and in particular, that is the case in South America, where the Quito process allows us to respond to the needs of more than 6.8 million people who had left their country in recent years. This is something that is of great concern, and we very much hope the IOM will continue providing its valuable support to the Quito process. And, Chair, I would like to conclude by repeating our commitment to uh, the principles of independence, neutrality, humanity, and impartiality and where we want to ensure that the human rights of migrants are given to all, because the only condition for that should be being human. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. I have Mozambique. Uh, you have the floor. Mr. Chairperson, Mr. Director General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson, for giving me the floor. On behalf of the Mozambique delegation, I would like to congratulate you, Ambassador Lansana Gebri, and all members of the Bureau for your election and for the excellent manner in which you are giving this session. Mozambique aligns itself with the statement delivered by Nigeria on behalf of the African group. Mr. Chair, my delegation thanks the OEM Director General, Mr. Antonio Vitorino, for the presentation of his report and welcome the progress made by the organization. We also commend the Director General for his leadership and commitment to the noble cause of ensuring a safe, orderly, and regular migration across the globe. Beforehand, we warmly welcome and welcome the Republic of Barbados 
as the 175 AM member state. Mr. Chairperson, this EM Council takes place at a critical moment characterized by multiple crises, such as the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, threats to food security, terrorism, and organized crime, which are contributing to a large number of migration flows and forced displacement. Ladies and gentlemen, the combination of consequences caused by the terrorist armed groups in northern Mozambique and cyclical natural disasters in the country, such as cyclones, floods, and droughts emerging from climate change, became a great cause for an increasing number of forced displacement in Mozambique. Therefore, my delegation calls to the international community for the need to build the resilience through prevention, risk reduction, adaptation, and sustainable mechanisms. We take this opportunity to thank EM for its commendable work in Mozambique, which contributes to build the resilience for the displaced population and the local communities exposed to multiple vulnerabilities. We express our sincere appreciation to the EM staff in Mozambique for their tireless work on the ground. To conclude, Mr. Chairperson, let me assure you that the Mozambique government is committed to working with IEM as the lead UN agency on immigration and with all members of the international community to strengthen our cooperation and for the achievement of the Global Compact for Migration Goals and other commitments to ensure social and economic integration of migrants. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I thank you, Excellency Brother Amadou. Thank you for the kind words. Um, Sudan, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Allow me at the outset to congratulate, to congratulate you and all members of the Bureau for your election. I would like also to express our heartfelt condolences to the government and people of China on the loss of the former president, Jiang Zemin. Sudan aligns itself with the statement delivered by Nigeria on behalf of the African group and by Egypt on behalf of the Arab group, and would like to thank the Director General for presenting his report. We would like also to express our appreciation to the IOM and its able leadership for the leading role in response to the current migration crisis and other humanitarian challenges caused by a number of factors, including conflicts, climate change, and economic difficulties. Sudan, as an active member of the IOM, was pleased to participate in the high-level segment of this Council session. We would like to strongly encourage the IOM and all stakeholders to embark on studying, analyzing, and planning for implementation of the many excellent ideas and proposals presented in. As we believe, this would significantly assist in fulfilling the mandate of the IOM to manage migration in a safe, orderly, and regular manner. Mr. Chair, Sudan is a country of origin, transit, and destination of migration. In addition of being one of the largest hosting countries of refugees in Africa, has been engaging actively and constructively in all regional and international fora that aim at addressing the, ne the negative impacts of climate change on food security and migration. In addition, as the current chair of IGAD, Sudan is working tirelessly to lead and coordinate the regional efforts aimed at addressing the existing challenges in the region including the acute impacts of droughts and floods on the lives and livelihoods of millions of people in the region. In this regard, we encourage IOM and all stakeholders to, re to redouble their efforts in assisting the affected communities, communities in the region to overcome the current food insecurity situation and provide the much-needed logistic and technical assistance to establish 
strong and effective early warning system in order to prevent the recurrent crisis in the region and build communities resilience. In conclusion, Mr. Chair, Sudan would like to reiterate its support to the IOM and encourage it to continue working with member states to better respond to the existing migration challenges for both countries of origin and countries of this nation. I thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Excellency. Uh, thank you. Um, I have Australia next. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for giving me the floor. And for those amongst us who have been paying attention this week, you will recall that Australia's views have been shared with this Council twice already, first through the Asia-Pacific Group statement on Wednesday, and secondly, as a party to the statement delivered by Ukraine yesterday. Um, in addition, the Australian Minister for Home Affairs has provided a written statement as a contribution to the high-level segment on the intersection between climate change, food security, migration and displacement, and I commend that statement to you. Um, as such, I intend to limit myself to two substantive issues under this agenda item. First is the importance Australia places on safe, orderly and regular migration. Migration is central to the Australian story. Today, more than 50% of Australians were either born overseas or have at least one parent who was born overseas and almost every country in the world is represented in our population. As the Australian Foreign Minister said when addressing the UN General Assembly in September, when Australians look out to the world, we see ourselves reflected in it. Equally, the world can see itself reflected in Australia. Successive waves of migration have shaped and influenced the development of a rich multicultural society and the blending of histories and cultures has resulted in a unique Australian identity. In short, migration has been a catalyst for our economic prosperity, our diversity and our social vibrancy. But managing migration is not a set and forget endeavour, which is why, as the Director General noted in his report on Wednesday, the Australian Government is currently reviewing the purpose, structure and objectives of Australia's migration system. When we look at Australia's future, we see some big challenges confronting us. We are transitioning to a climate neutral economy. We need to increase our productivity. We need to recruit a caring workforce to look after an aging population. And we need to build our sovereign capability across a range of sectors. As the Australian Minister for Home Affairs often says, the migration system is not the full answer to any of these challenges but it is a part answer to all of them. The review is intended to deliver a migration system that will drive economic growth and resilience while maintaining public confidence in the integrity of the system. The second substantive issue I want to touch on is the Bali process, and 2022 represents the 20th anniversary of the Bali process. Irregular migration exposes vulnerable people to risk of exploitation and physical danger, and undermines public confidence in government migration systems. For the last 20 years, the Bali process, co-chaired by Australia and Indonesia, has been bringing together 45 member states alongside valued international organisation partners, including IOM, to raise awareness in our region of the consequences of people smuggling, trafficking in persons and related transnational crime. This is in recognition that migration is often a regional phenomenon and that effective responses to migration challenges need to be regional. The Bali process continues to provide a platform for regular dialogue and capacity building with a view to ensuring migration in our region is safe, orderly and regular. Mr Chair, Director General, Australia values its partnership with IOM across both of these priorities and more broadly in your support to delivery of Australia's migration program and to the delivery of capacity building assistance to critical partners such as Papua New Guinea and Timor-Leste as those delegations referenced in their statements earlier in the week. In your active participation in the work of the Bali process, both at the strategic and operational levels 
and in your thought leadership on issues of migration, as demonstrated once again by the high-level segment earlier this week. Australia looks forward to continuing our close and productive partnership for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Australia. I have now Thailand. You have the floor, please. Chairperson, Director General, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, I would like to join the others in congratulating Chair and the Bureau members on the nominations to the meeting. Thailand avails itself with the statement previously made by Distinguished Representative of the Republic of Korea on behalf of the Asia Pacific Group. We thank the Director General for a very comprehensive update on migration situations around the world and commend relentless dedication of IOM to provide timely humanitarian assistance to migrants fleeing from conflicts and affecting by disasters, climate change, or the other crises. We also recognize IOM's active roles in promoting the implementation of the global impact on migration and facilitating its review at the IMRF earlier this year. Thailand welcomes the agreement reached on IOM budget reform with some built-in flexibilities. We hope that the increased budget and the improved core structure will enable IOM to effectively and efficiently respond to the growing demand for its services, enhancing accountability and oversight of the organization, and also ensure that its activities are fully aligned with the interests and needs of countries in which it operates. As the host of an IOM country mission and a regional office, Thailand stands ready to support and facilitate the work of those offices in any way we can, including through the conclusion of the new host country agreement that appropriately reflect IOM's status as a related agency within the UN system. As a major destination of migrant workers in Southeast Asia, Thailand attaches great importance to the enhancement and improvement of regular pathways. We recently concluded the revised MOU on labor cooperation with our neighbor countries, which are the sources of migrant workers in Thailand. Together with the resumption of cross-border movement, this has led to the entry of around 200,000 migrant workers since the beginning of May this year. Such regularized pathway paves a solid foundation for migrants' access to social security and basic services. Nonetheless, health services and education as accessible to all, regardless of their migration status, as per our policy of universal health coverage and education for all. As a friend of the universal health coverage and the GCM champion uh, country, we stand ready to share our experiences and cooperate with other countries to further promote the right to health for all, including migrants. On another front, prevention and combating human trafficking and smuggling and victim assistance remain, in, remain high in our government's agenda. In this regard, IOM has played a role in the development of our national ref re referral mechanism and the operation planned to combat smuggling of migrants, as well as in capacity building for officers from relevant agencies. 
We look forward to continuing partnership with IOM on issues of mutual interest. I thank you. And I thank you, Thailand. Um, I now yield the floor to the Director General. Thank you very much, Chair. Pertaining to the statement made by the uh, His Excellency Basio of Paraguay, I'd like to commend the approval of the new migration law, which undoubtedly acknowledges the rights of migrants in accordance with the Global Compact for safe, orderly and regular migration. And, and it will open up the way for the implementation of the migratory policy of Paraguay, which will also have the support of IOM. Moreover, in Paraguay's case, the cooperation that we have in strengthening capacity building of the border control posts and we will improve every day the uh, capacities of the MIDAS system. And this is an excellent example for many other countries. To Mozambique, I would like to express uh, my uh, appreciation for the decision taken by the government to adopt the policy and strategy for internal displacement management focusing on prevention, preparedness, and finding uh, durable solutions. For us, this is extremely important, as well as the Maputo Declaration that was adapted, adopted in September 2022, following the initiative of the United Nations Secretary General to enhance preparedness and uh, set up an early warning system, of which the President of Mozambique is a champion in uh, Africa. Indeed, Mozambique is a country particularly hit by natural disasters, and this early warning mechanism and the preparation, adaptation, and prevention of the impacts of uh, uh, extreme weather events in the population is uh, of utmost importance. IOM is probably the largest uh, UN agency in the north of the country, where we work closely with the authorities in order to prevent and support people uh, from uh, conflict and from uh, uh, displacement due to the action of terrorist groups and also due to the um, events, the climatic uh, events. And uh, Mozambique can go on counting with our full engagement. In relation to Sudan, I would like to express my thanks for Sudan being a co-signatory of the Kampala Declaration that paved the way to COP27 on climate change and forced displacement. And we hope that in the chairmanship of the IGAD, Sudan will be able to spread the principles and ideas of the Kampala Declaration all over the region. I also want to emphasize that we have been working closely with Sudan's labor migration policy, and we expect it to be adopted in the near future. And last but not least, we want to join Sudan in making an appeal to the donor uh, community to support uh, the development of the triple nexus uh, agenda of the UN system in Sudan. Currently, OSHA's financial tracking service shows us that the Sudan humanitarian response plan for 2022 is financed less than 39% at the same time as the needs are on the rise, and Sudan can count on IOM to support these efforts. Concerning uh, Australia, I would like to uh, um, praise the commitment of the Australian government to uh, engage uh, in the labour mobility in the Pacific uh, region through the Pacific Australia Labour Mobility Scheme that uh, we support, and bringing together the areas of humanitarian assistance uh, and uh, development. IOM is a particularly appropriate partner in this respect, thanks to the extensive and increasing footprint of uh, the organization in the Pacific Island uh, countries. As well, we are very much committed to cooperate with Australia in the development of its uh, policy review on migration, Providing a multi-generational migration strategy to the country, we have uh, provided our inputs 
to the evolving migration policy and systems of uh, Australia, and uh, we look forward to a positive conclusion of the current negotiations of the strategic partnership uh, framework between the government of Australia and IOM. And last but not least, I would emphasize the role that IOM provides the support of the regional consultative process of Bali, led by Australia and uh, Indonesia, which is one of the most successful regional processes we have known. And we congratulate for the 20th anniversary, and uh, we expect to be attending the ministerial conference to celebrate this important event. In relation to Thailand, uh, we uh, congratulate Thailand for having been upgraded in terms of the uh, U.S. State Department's traffic in reports in persons 2022 and for the efforts deployed by the Thai, the Royal Thai government uh, to combat human trafficking and protecting the victims and their rights, as well as we uh, stand ready to support Thailand in the post-COVID-19 recovery, particularly in guaranteeing universal health coverage to everybody in Thailand, including uh, the migrant workers, as well as uh, we uh, appreciate the resuming of the Memorandum of Understanding for Regular Labour Migration that has just been mentioned by His Excellency the Ambassador with uh, Cambodia, Lao People's Democratic Republic uh, and uh, Myanmar. And uh, last but not least, I would like very much to welcome the announcement made by His Excellency, uh, Excellency the Ambassador that uh, we will be it will be possible to conclude the host country agreement for IOM. Indeed, uh, since 2016, we are part of the UN system, and having the host country agreement guaranteeing to IOM the same privileges and immunities that, is, that the Royal Thai government grants to the other UN agencies is critical for the operations of our country office in Bangkok and for our regional office for the Asia-Pacific region that is also based in your capital. Thank you so much. Thank you, DG. Um, I have Yemen. You have the floor, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Yemen aligned itself with the statement of Arab groups and IBG group. My President, at the outset, I would like to congratulate you, Your Excellency, on your election as Chairman of the Council, wishing you all the best. I am pleased to extend my sincere thanks and appreciation to His Excellency, the Director General of IOM, for, his re for the report. Thanks also to the IOM Secretariat for their efforts. Mr. President, this meeting comes and my country, Yemen, is still going through exceptional circumstances is the cause of the wars just by the, by the Houthi terrorist militias on the Yemeni people, which led the country to a complete economic collapse and a catastrophic deterioration in the humanitarian aspects. The last of the is the last of was the militia refusal to extend the truce on October 2nd, 2022. The Houthis is even just refused refuse to enter into peace process. When instead they continue to target displaced people, migrants, oil resources, maritime navigations, and neighboring countries. This COP is resulted a tricky humanitarian situation where 25 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance. The number of displaced Yemeni people has risen to 5 million. It is also estimated that the number of Yemeni migrants abroad due to this war has rushed 2 million. Mr. President, <clears throat> the Republic of Yemen is gives the issue of migration a top priority, as Yemen is a country of Oregon, return and transit, whereas the statistics of the International Organization for Migration will indicate that the proportion of migrants arriving in Yemen is through the Gulf of Aden and Red Sea is during the first half of 2022 is witnessed an, inc an increase compared to the last year, is given the difficult 
a condition that Yemen is experiencing, which has increased the suffer of illegal migrants as they are exploited by the Houthi tourist militias and other armed groups, is including the fire that engulfed the detention center of illegal migration in Sana'a is look, as look, under the control of the Houthi militias and other violations. Mr. President, in voluntary humanitarian return, the Republic of Yemen has signed an agreement in 2021 with the Ethiopian government and the IOM to operate a voluntary return flight from Aden to Addis Ababa. We thank IOM for the commitment and we can assure our full support to facilitate the, the voluntary humanitarian return. In this context, we urge the international community to fulfill their commitment and provide the support needed. In conclusion, the Republic of Yemen reaffirms that the effective solutions for the continued influence of refugees and migrants lies in addressing the root causes and strengthening cooperation and coordination with the relevant countries. I thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you. Um, I have Cyprus. You have the floor, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and congratulations on your election. Cyprus aligns itself with the statement delivered on behalf of the European Union. I wish to express our gratitude to the IOM for its enormous work and to Director General Vitorino for his leadership during these particularly challenging times. Cyprus shares global concerns on the ever-rising number of forcibly displaced persons driven by interlinking reasons such as conflicts, the effects of climate change, and the enduring negative impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. The unlawful invasion of Ukraine by Russia has created the displacement of millions of Ukrainians. The ensuing energy and exacerbated food insecurity crisis have hit the most vulnerable around the world and will continue for forcing ever more people to flee. Mr. Chair, Cyprus remains a frontline state in terms of facing multifaceted migratory challenges. It remains the European Union member state with the highest member, number of applications for international protection in relation to its population size for the fifth year in a row. Applicants and beneficiaries of international protection in Cyprus amount to 6% of the country's population. While striving to manage these challenges, our capacities are undeniably being tested. As we continuously adapt our national policies, the cornerstone of our efforts remains the respect for international law and our EU obligations, including respecting the rights of migrants irrespective of their status. To this end, we have been enhancing our legal framework. We have been focusing on capacity building, and we have been opening up new avenues for regular migration in Cyprus. We are stepping up the fight against smugglers and human traffickers. Within the European Union, we are committed to the principle of the fair sharing of responsibility and solidarity in all respects of migration management. Cooperating with countries outside the European Union is a critical priority for us with a view to better managing migratory flows. In complementing our national policies, the IOM's Cyprus office runs targeted programs on capacity building for unaccompanied migrant children on a voluntary solidarity mechanism and on assisted voluntary return and reintegration. We would like to express our gratitude to the organization for its valuable help. Last but not least, I would like to mention that from the very beginning of the invasion of Ukraine, Cyprus has offered temporary protection to Ukrainian refugees, receiving tens of thousands of new applications for international protection, and per capita has received the second highest number of Ukrainians in the EU this past spring. IOM's work has and will continue to have an indispensable and positive impact on populations and communities across the world. As the challenges of our world 
and of vulnerable human beings magnify. The only answer is that we, together, strengthen our resolve in attaining a global framework for comprehensive migration management. Cyprus remains committed to this goal. Thank you. I thank you, Cyprus. Um, Colombia, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. And I'd like to congratulate you for your appointment to the Chair of this Council session. On behalf of the Government of Colombia, we would like to convey our heartfelt condolences to China and their delegation for the recent passing of the former President Yang Zemin. I'd also like to welcome Barbados as a new member of the IOM, another country in our region of Latin America and the Caribbean. One more member who aligns itself to the framework of this organization's work in our common cause for the rights of migrants. Colombia also aligns itself with the regional declaration made by Grulac, which was given by the Ambassador of Panama yesterday. As a champion country of the Global Compact on Migration, we would like to reiterate our active commitment to the rights of the migrant people. In reflection of this, we're also developing a feminist foreign policy, which is based on human rights based approach. And this will not criminalise the migrant and acknowledges the migrant as the centre of policies and actions in the area of migration. The full enjoyment of fundamental rights of a person cannot be limited by borders. Director, yourself and the delegations from Panama made reference to what is happening in the Darien rainforest. This is a geographic region between Colombia and Panama, who for its uh, geographical location is being used by some people in their passage towards North America. This is a tropical rainforest that doesn't have any type of infrastructure for the safe transit of people who are setting out to cross this tropical rainforest or for those who opt to do so by boat to Panama in ill-equipped vessels who are putting their very lives at risk. Some of these people are women and young girls who could be victims of human or sexual trafficking, sexual exploitation and different forms of gender-based violence and abuses. Director, for the government of the President Gustavo Petro, the upholding and promotion of rights of women and young girls is at the very centre of its national and international agenda. Thus, we are calling and urging the international community so that we increase our efforts in the areas of prevention so that women and mig migrant women and young girls have access to all information that they need. They have the assistance, support, guidance and services which might be necessary in order to avoid that they fall victims to gender based violence to which they may be exposed by using this irregular pathways to migrate. Many of these women and young girls take these pathways because they are victims of uh, misinformation, they are tricked and swindled by unscrupulous people who promise them that they'll get to their final destination without any hiccups or setbacks, which is never certain. We must all put a stop to this false information, which leads people to take irregular pathways to migrate, such as the Darien Gap is an example of this. Director, the President Gustavo Petro, with the Total Peace Policy hopes to continue uh, to count upon the support of the IOM by building and implementing, implementing lasting solutions for IDPs. For a number of uh, years, we've had the support of the IOM, and we will sure that we'll continue to receive this support. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the IOM for the uh, contribution that it gave us by drafting the chapter on the Colombian exile in the Truth Commission report. The truth is that, is that whilst looking for justice, reparation and guarantee that we're not repeating the conflicts which we've seen over the years. We'd also like to convey our gratitude to the IMO for their support and the joint work with the government of Colombia and its institutions and its projects for peace and stability, female empowerment and reintegration of former soldiers. The latter has been done with the support of friendly nations such as Sweden, the United States and the UK, to whom we would like to convey our gratitude. Director, the work of your team has been absolutely critical in the integration of more than 2.4 million Venezuelan migrants whom we are whom we have welcomed and whom we are giving a regular status. The government of the present, Pedro, would like to make further headway on the guarantees to ensure that these migrants, migrants can have full enjoyment of their rights in Colombia and across the region. Thus, and in order to work together, we must base ourselves on the principle of shared responsibility. 
We'd also like to convey our gratitude um, to the response plan, which we saw yesterday in the Interagency Coordination Platform for Refugees and Migrants, which was launched yesterday, which I am um, part of, with a view to gathering the necessary funding in order to m meet the needs of the Venezuelan migrant population in Latin America and Caribbean. Our government is working on the socioeconomic integration of those Venezuelans who are in our country, and with their support and in the, of the support of other international entities, we will achieve this. And we will also work in conjunction with the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. In this vein, we will also count upon the support of the IOM and the International Donor Conference, which is set for the next, uh, the first quarter of 2023. The active participation of the international community is critically important for the success in um, financial resources which allow us to step our efforts um, in this area, in the region, to assist those most vulnerable migrants. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Colombia, I have Belarus, please. You have the floor. Monsieur le Président, Monsieur... Chair, Director General, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, I would like to convey my sincere congratulations to you, Chair, and the Bureau of the Council for your appointment, as well as Barbados, for their accession to the IOM. I would also like to convey our condolences to China for the recent passing of the former President Jiang Zemin. It is with great satisfaction that we have welcomed the exhaustive report of the DG on the activities of IOM, which shows the, um, the importance of these issues which we are dealing with in this organisation. We support the efforts undertaken by IOM in order to implement these activities and to include mobility in the planning development processes of the UN, in particular set against a backdrop of an unprecedented increase of the number of migrants and IDPs throughout the world. At the national level, Belarus is looking to address migratory issues at the local, national and international levels. The, the Sustainable Development National Strategy to 2030 is in step with the commitments of Belarus in the framework of the Global Compact on Migration. The strategic guidelines of the state with a view to ensure safe, orderly and legal migration are enshrined within legislative documents in development plans and key sectoral policies. The country were, has set up and improved conditions to ensure equal access to migrants to the labour market, to education and to medical services into ALIA. The main cooperation areas in the framework of the CIS, the Community of Independent States, and the EEC are part of the joint work which stems to eliminate hurdles to migrant um, population and their social protection. Belarus has been one of the developers of the unified um, research system working without borders and the first digital project in the area of migration in the EU, EU rather, as well as a better practice in the areas of recommendation of the migration lab labour uh, workforce. We're using simplification to access to legal channels for migration for the workforce through bilateral agreements on migrant worker exchange practices. The working area within the country, as well as internationally, is to combat illegal migration and human trafficking. The International Training Centre of Training for Migration and to Combat Human Trafficking, which is set up with the support of the IOM in Minsk, regularly ensures the training of experts in this area from countries in the com Community of Independent States in 2021. The law and order forces of Belarus have blocked 10 uh, traffic channels. More than 100 crimes in this area were detected. We, are, we would like to convey our gratitude to the IOM, who has helped the government and agencies to identify the victims of human tra trafficking, more than 200 people, including minors, and to provide support for their reintegration, which has been provided to about 120 people. 30 of these have been minors. I'd also like to underscore the joint project with the IOM and the Ministry of the Interior and NGOs of Belarus, which has given a straight line to a safe uh, travelling for uh, working abroad. 
which over the last three years, more than 12,000 Belarusian citizens and foreigners have received free advice. We are interested to continue this project. I'd also like to note positively the outcomes of the joint project with IOM on strengthening and stepping up tolerance towards migrants and their migration. And the implementation of this will come to an end in 2022. To conclude, I'd also like to underscore the interest and the commitment of Belarus to increase cooperation with IOM and the states of origin, destination and transit of migrants. On a large uh, number of issues pertaining to the assessment of the trends and the challenges in the area of migration. Cross-border cooperation based upon common responsibility of the member states of the UN, mutual respect of the needs and the problems linked to migration. Not only will this promote and foster promotion of our national interests, but above all, it will contribute to minimising the risks and the minimization of risk and the protection of vulnerable persons, preventing, preventing the deaths of innocent people, victims of irregular and illegal human trafficking. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, Mongolia, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. At the outset, I would like to thank to, to the Director General and the Deputy Director General for their leadership, as well as the staff of IOM, for their hard work and dedication during these uncertain times. Mr. Chair, the world is witnessing significant challenges, beginning with global pandemic, climate change, disastrous armed conflicts, and large-scale socioeconomic calamities. These challenges are causing devastating effects on migrants and are raising global concern. Mongolia commends the agility of IOM to endure these negative implications through its continued assistance and support to migrants. In these difficult times we, where we can find ourselves with increasing danger of food and energy crisis, rising prices and geopolitical tensions, it's imperative that all countries remain committed to achieving the sustainable development goals and take responsive actions to address a global displacement erasing from climate change, environmental degradation, conflict and persecution. The unique role of IOM is the leading UN agency in migration remains to the more critical than ever to tackle and mitigate the negative impacts of these upheavals. Mr. Chair, the major shortcomings of both international and internal migration have immense impact on socioeconomic development of Mongolia. Despite the influx of labor migrants leaving Mongolia, considerable number of people in intra-rural and rural to urban migration thus not bode well for our further approach to effectively mainstream internal migration into development. Is the junctions, Mongolia is confused that the collective step towards budget reform with the adoption of Standing Committee Resolution No. 31 in June was an important decision by Member States in increasing the relevance and values of IOM. Moreover, Mongolia underlines the critical role of IOM in the collective action and response against climate change, environmental degradation and disasters that are reshaping contemporary human mobility patterns. Mongolia commences the IOM's recent report, People on the Move in a Changing Climate, Linking Policy, Evidence and Action, which provides communities, partners, governments and UN agencies with guidelines to scale up the implementation of adaptive actions. Mr. Chair, Mongolia reaffirms our support for the central role of IOM in migration and continue working closely in the year ahead to overcome challenges and build resilience. I thank you, Mr. Chair. And I thank you, uh, Mongolia. Director General, you have the floor. Thank you so much. We acknowledge the fact that uh, Yemen remains a very difficult operational environment uh, for all the international community and agencies. 
and uh, uh, we see in a, at a positive light the fact that uh, an agreement has been possible to uh, organize a number of voluntary humanitarian return flights that uh, supported 2,500 migrants to return to their country of origin in 2022. But uh, we also noticed that there is an increased number of new arrivals. Uh, up to the end of October 2022, we had registered 50,000 arrivals in Yemen in an environment where there is a tension and conflict. And those arrivals, uh, those arriving, need urgently assistance in line with the humanitarian uh, principles. For us, e Yemen cannot be seen uh, separate from the uh, region of the Horn of Africa. And uh, we clear to Bell to have a joint approach and integrated approach to this region. And we will launch uh, our new regional migration response plan early next year. But we all know that uh, uh, the situation in Yemen can only be solved by uh, establishing sustainable peace. And uh, uh, after seven years of war, that is critical for the future of the country. I want to express to Cyprus uh, uh, that uh, we are fully aware that uh, Cyprus is on the front line of strong migratory flows. 60% of the Eastern Mediterranean arrivals in 2021, 12,350 people were arriving in Cyprus. And this year, by the end of October, we have already registered 15,160 arrivals, both by land and sea. From our side, you can go on counting on our support, particularly in the improving of the living conditions in the camps and trying to find solutions to accommodate this uh, flow. We, we expect that the uh, voluntary solidarity mechanism of the European Union can provide also support to Cyprus. We welcome particularly the expansion of the alternative care model of housing and integration for uh, unaccompanied migrant children that, in which we are working closely with the Ministry of uh, Social Welfare of Cyprus. In response to Colombia, first of all, I wanted to re recognize the very good cooperation when it comes to the registration of the Venezuelan citizens who have been displaced uh, to Colombia. The ambassador, His Excellency, mentioned uh, 2.4 million. That uh, register is carried out under the cooperation platform that we have with the UNHCR and other United Nations agencies. And we will continue to support the government of uh, Colombia in working on the integration, assistance and support to Venezuelans displaced to their country. But as the ambassador said, it, there are also major concerns for migrants who transit through the country towards the Darien jungles, in particular the children, women and adolescents who are extremely exposed to violence and exploitation. I am pleased to hear the support of uh, Colombia from President Gustavo Petro to the climate change agenda. The president made a very important statement at the uh, summit in Sharm el Sheikh. And of course, we will continue to support plans for total peace in the country and lasting solutions for internally displaced persons, as well as working on preventing displacement, working on community stabilization and other protection systems that the government of Colombia has adopted. And you can count on the IOM for the organization of the International Donor Conference along with UNHCR and the platform. And uh, Canada is going to be, and the European Union will be uh, setting this up at the beginning of next year. In response to Belarus, I would like to uh, say that we support the actions on the border region to support Ukrainian refugees, and uh, we are also very committed 
to finding the best humanitarian response and to continue with our efforts to fight against human trafficking and ensuring there is protection for victims in line with the Global Compact on Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration. And we will be working with the resident coordinators for the UN, the, the Migration Network in Belarusia. Mongolia, I uh, want to express uh, my appreciation for the decision of deploying uh, the displacement tracking metrics of IOM in uh, Mongolia, which is a new ongoing tool for better understanding and analyzing the internal migration in the country. And we strongly support you in fully including migrants in the social economic development of uh, Mongolia in line with the, the 2050 Mongolia vision. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Director General. Thank you. Um, Honduras, you have the floor. Senor Presidente, Senor Director Chair, Director General, distinguished delegates. Honduras would like to thank the Director General for his report and aligns itself with the GRULAC statement. Today, I am here representing the government of our President Somara Castro, the first uh, female president of Honduras, who has set migration as a human right and a social fact. And it is under this uh, approach that we are setting out elements that must be considered when tackling and managing migration. Currently, more than a million Hondurans abroad decided to uh, migrate due to the, econ so the global economic system. In the case of Honduras, uh, neoliberal policies have uh, forced uh, the exit of thousands of our citizens. And in addition to the consequences of the pandemic, uh, natural disasters, climate change, the uh, unilateral coercive uh, decisions by the global north uh, and uh, the imposition of measures and sanctions, uh, which are economic and blockades on countries such as Cuba and Venezuela, affect transit through our country. In the same way, neocolonialism, armed conflict, uh, uneven trade, uh, coup d'etat and high levels of economic dependence have meant that uh, up until the 25th of November 2022, more than 163,000 migrants had entered our territory irregularly. And our projections are that in 2023, this number will increase if we don't work on tackling the structural causes of irregular migration. We have to stop talking now about migration in a romantic way. It is necessary to open the public discussion and look at the management of migration. We need to correctly read the causes that are linked to material and historic reasons and directly impact on immigration, where the main actors in these processes need to be the migrants and their family members. They have to take up this subject which without doubt affects them directly. In particular, we have to think of women, children and adolescents in this context. Irregular migrant flows in the country has gone beyond the institutional capacities of our state. Nevertheless, we are committed to continue implementing a policy of protection and not of containment or of return. That's why we have set out a management strategy at the border which finally has the protection of the migrant throughout the governmental status with a, migratory, a migration amnesty which uh, excludes them from paying a fines for having entered the country through unauthorized points. Efforts in this are vital, in particular the assistance of civil society, international cooperation, the United Nations systems through the IOM and uh, UNHCR, and uh, we'd like to highlight the support that the IOM gave to our National Migration Institute in building a migration policy document. We are committed to achieving the agenda in terms of migration that we can see in the global GCM and uh, the global compact uh, for safe, orderly and regular migration. 
and uh, we are making progress along with the Regional Migration Conference, uh, the Ibero-American Migration Authorities Network, and other bodies. We must not criminalize migration in any of its aspects. It is a right and not a crime, and we need to make greater efforts to fight cross-border organized crime on a regional basis. There will not be a reduction in migration flows if the current economic model continues to dominate the agenda of countries in the global south. Cooperation foreign investment will not be enough if we don't review the economic model that currently dominates. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Republic of Moldova, you have the floor, please. Dear Chairperson, Director General, Excellencies and Distinguished Delegates, I am honored to address the Council and to welcome the diligent effort of the IOM and its member states to further build up support to effectively respond to the cumulative challenges we are facing. We thank the Director General for the report presented this Wednesday and for the insightful comments made as regards long-term responses the IOM and the entire UN Migration Network are to deliver in the future. The Republic of Moldova appreciates the efforts made and the special role of the IOM in coordinating the activities related to the process of ensuring the efficient management of migratory flows at global and regional level, the implementation of the measures that contribute to an orderly and safe migration of persons. On a national note, migration remains an important socio-economic trend for Moldova, a country with one of the highest total migration rates in the world, which lately is noticing a continuous increase of immigration flows as well. Thus, our long-term goal is to address migration's demographic, social and macroeconomic effects by tackling the underlying development challenges in multiple sectors and making Moldova a better and a safer place along with favoring the unlocking of the migration potential for sustainable development. In this regard, important measures have been taken, as is the adoption of the National Development Strategy that sets the strategic vision for the development of the country in the next seven years, including in areas related to migration and asylum, as well as the program for managing the migration flows, asylum, and integration of foreigners. Mr. Chair. For the Republic of Moldova, the current session of the IOM Council comes at a time when our country is facing an unprecedented massive influx of refugees from Ukraine. Energy insecurity, economic and social challenges following the act of aggression committed by the Russian Federation against Ukraine and its people. Since the onset of the war, the Republic of Moldova has received more than 600 50,000 arrivals from Ukraine, and over 80,000 refugees have chosen to remain with more than half being children. As part of the provisions of the state of emergency instituted in our country, Moldova has created a legal framework to protect and integrate refugees, which also includes access to health care, education, and labor market. At the same time, a draft government decision on granting temporary protection to refugees from Ukraine has been developed and is in the process of being finalized. As Ukraine continues to be under attack, an escalation in missile attacks on civilians and critical energy infrastructure would lead to a new wave of refugees fleeing to Moldova, with whom Ukraine is having the longest western border with. Our country is preparing to host more in the winter should they need to flee a military escalation or lack of heat, electricity and water. But this will put additional pressure on already strained budgetary and human capacities. We are grateful to the development partners, IOM and other UN agencies, which have responded to emerging needs in our country in this crisis. As Moldova is currently confronting with a twin challenge of high risk of disruption of electricity and gas supply and prohibitive prices for its consumers, these could jeopardize our stability and security. Just in the past year, the cost of natural gas went up seven times. The cost for electricity increased 
four times, whereas the accessibility of electricity for the population decreased three times. Under these circumstances, with worsened cost of living and being at the forefront of emerging threats as a result of the war, smuggling of arms, drugs, goods and people, we need further support to enhance our capabilities. On a final note, Director General Vitorino, taking this opportunity, I would like to express my gratitude for the fruitful cooperation that exists between the Republic of Moldova and the IOM, as well as for the valuable assistance offered by the UN Migration Agency in ensuring that my country advances in embracing the global goal of making migration work for all. On another note, your visit paid to Kishino this spring, following the massive flows of refugees, is perceived as a great sign of solidarity and empathy towards my country and region for which we personally thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Republic of Moldova. Vietnam, we have the floor. Chairperson, Director General. Distinguished delegates, I would like to join previous speakers in congratulating you on your election as chairperson of the Council and welcoming the Baders to the membership of the organization. Vietnam highly appreciates the role and contribution of the IOM as the UN agency in charge of promoting regular, safe and orderly international migration and resolving migration challenges. Since the Global Compact for Safe orderly and regular migration was adopted in December 2018, the IOM has strongly extended technical and financial support to member states. This important assistance helped to promote joint efforts at national, regional and global levels and create a safe and transparent migration environment for promoting and, protect and protecting the rights and interests of migrants. Vietnam also highly appreciates the cooperation between the IOM and Vietnam, which has increasingly been strengthened over the years. The IOM has strongly supported Vietnam in carrying out the JCM National Plan through many projects, particularly the project promoting evidence-based policy making in the context of cross-border migration in Vietnam. Chairperson, it is widely observed that as countries have better control of the COVID-19 pandemic, international migration are accelerating again. This phenomenon also comes along with various matters, including human trafficking and migrant smuggling with new tactics, especially in cyberspace. Against that context, it is crucial for IOM member states and the international community to work more closely to resolve the root causes of illegal migration, namely poverty, crisis, climate change, and facilitate regular safe and orderly migration. Thanks to the experiences in its response to the COVID-19, Vietnam believes that integrating health issues in managing international migration is very important. We are pleased to note the growing engagement of member states in the discussion of climate change and the interlinkage between climate change, food security, and human mobility. Vietnam believes that urgent actions and comprehensive approach are needed to better protect and promote the rights of vulnerable groups, including migrants in the context of climate change. Developing countries, especially those particularly vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change, need support to enhance their resilience and capacity to tackle climate change impacts on human mobility. We look forward to the IOM's continued support to member states in improving their capacity in managing international migration and implementing the JCM. Before concluding my statement, I would like to reaffirm Vietnam's commitment to work closely with stakeholders in the field of migration as well as implementing the JCM to promote regular, safe and orderly international migration, protecting the rights and the interests of migrants. I thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Thank you very much, Vietnam. Um, I have Slovakia. You have the floor. 
Thank you, Chairman. Slovakia aligns itself with the statement of the EU delivered earlier today. Uh, I would like to join others also in thanking the Director General for his, for his report highlighting the complex uh, challenges of international migration amid highest levels of movement on record. We share the concern about the impact of overlapping global crises related to climate change, poverty, health emergencies and uh, food insecurity on international migration. The delegation of Slovakia would like to express our appreciation and uh, full support to IOM's important mandate and work, including its contribution to fostering international cooperation and coordination on migration issues. We thank the organization for its life-saving assistance to reach beneficiaries impacted by emergencies around the world, including those impacted by the war in Ukraine. Mr. Chairman, since Russia unleashed war on Ukraine nine months ago, one third of Ukrainians have been forced to leave their homes, including millions displaced inside the country itself. Slovakia, a neighboring country of 5.4 million people, uh, has granted temporary protection to more than 100,000 Ukrainians, mostly women and children. More than a million passed through Slovakia to other safe countries. After Russia's invasion of Ukraine, IOM has been providing assistance to affected persons arriving in Slovakia from Ukraine. Here I take the opportunity to thank the IOM for all its interventions, aid and support in Slovakia in connection with this war. The Slovak government is committed to continue supporting Ukrainians in need, including through partnership and collaboration with the IOM. In October, the government adopted a new contingency plan to ramp up the capacity of the state to assist refugees arriving in Slovakia due to the Russian aggression against Ukraine covering the period of October 2022 to March 2023. Mr. Chairperson, uh, we are concerned also about the risks, including for migrants associated with irregular migration and the cynical criminal business of human trafficking. There has been a sharp increase in the interceptions of undocumented migrants in terms of secondary migratory flows from the previous year. The increased migratory pressure uh, opens the question of returns. We are looking for possibilities. Uh, Frontex has supported us in our efforts and there is a persistent need uh, for cooperation with countries of transit and origin. We are also working with our neighbors and partners regarding, regarding illegal migration and people smuggling. Before closing, uh, let me welcome the success of the budget reform agreed this year and reiterate our, our strong support to further institutional strengthening of the IOM. Chair, uh, as has been stressed, the global nature of migration calls for effective multilateral cooperation and Rest assured that uh, my government uh, will contribute uh, to, this, uh, to, this, to, to, to its strengthening. And being the last speaker between the lunch and, uh, and you, uh, I would like to commend myself to be and stay within the allocated 30, uh, three minutes uh, in my speech. I thank you. Thank you, uh, Slovakia, except for this slight error. The last speaker will be the Director General before I close up. Okay, thank, thank, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Bueno, eh, eh. In response to Honduras, I wanted to welcome the decision of the President to adopt a migration policy which, in uh, each of its uh, phases of implementation, will bring greater protection to all migrants, uh, as well as the fact that we are working together with the authorities on contingency plans for emergency situations with a strong gender focus so that we can find responses for protection and support to the many migrants who pass through Honduras. And this highlights the importance of having an integrated regional vision of migratory flows, as we heard uh, in the Los Angeles Declaration. I want to express uh, my solidarity and my appreciation for the very effective response of the, Ukrainian, of the Moldovan authorities to the crisis in Ukraine, but above all of the Moldovan society. Indeed, uh, Moldova has kept its borders open. I had the, the opportunity to see how uh, the Moldovan border guard was organizing the arrivals of uh, uh, Ukrainian migrants and then setting up the green corridor that allows them to uh, depart from the border towards other destinations. 
and uh, as well as the fact that the vast majority of the Ukrainians that are in Moldova are hosted in uh, private houses. But we know that this situation is particularly sensitive uh, due to the burden that represents to the society in Moldova confronted with uh, energy problems and economic and social challenges. And that's why I join my voice to your voice in asking for the support of the donors. We are adopting in Moldova contingency plannings. Uh, we, do not, uh, we cannot discard the possibility of having new waves of uh, arrivals uh, due to the harsh winter in Ukraine and the situation of the electricity and the energy in the country. And we are, of course, prepositioning the necessary goods in the country and in the neighborhood to cope with such a possible challenge. In relation to Vietnam, I want to start by thanking the support of the government in assisting 303 uh, stranded Sri, Sri Lankan migrants that were rescued at the sea, providing humanitarian assistance and protection, uh, express our commitment to deploy uh, our data collection uh, activities in order to uh, provide the evidence to improve the counter-traffic national action plan as well as the national implementation plan for the global compact and appreciate the, the government of Vietnam leadership and commitment to tackle uh, climate uh, change that uh, has a serious impact in the country. On a different note, I would like to congratulate uh, the Vietnamese firm G8A Architects for having won the design competition for the new energy efficient and environmental sustainable IOM headquarters building here in um, uh, Geneva. Last but not least to Slovakia, I want to emphasize that uh, we uh, support your decision to provide uh, the temporary protection directive to uh, refugees from Ukraine as well as uh, third country nationals since the very first uh, days. We uh, recognize that there is an increase of irregular migration toward the country, and we are ready to support you in terms of a voluntary return and reintegration, and uh, we uh, stay committed to a very close cooperation and that is very successful with a scaled-up mission that we have now in Bratislava. Thank you so much. So I must say that I overpassed two minutes from one o'clock. Mea culpa. Uh, thank you, um, DG. Uh, thank you uh, to all delegations for, uh, for your statements. Um, I'm informed by the Secretary that there are a few more statements to make. I, I hope not many, but I fear that may be so. <laughs> um, so we shall resume uh, this afternoon at 3 p.m. And now it's time for all to rush for lunch. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>